l'Assemblée va... Let's, the Assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Mikhail Saakashvili, President of Georgia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mikhail Saakashvili. President of Georgia. And to invite him to address the Assembly. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished delegates, it is a great honor, of course, to address the 66th plenary session of the United Nations General Assembly on behalf of my people. The United Nations is the international community's greatest legacy of the last century, an institution resulting from both history's most outrageous crimes and from humanity's capacity to confront, reckon with, and overcome the consequences of such crimes. Such human contradictions, the highest heaven and the deepest abyss to quote Friedrich Schelling are symbolized by the two remarkable anniversaries we commemorate this year. I was surprised that no one so far mentioned it this whole, but now is the 20th year's anniversary since the Soviet Union collapsed, freeing captive nations and emancipating oppressed peoples, unleashing the dreams of millions, putting an end to decades of Cold War and the apocalyptic nuclear race, heralding a new era of international relations. It was clearly not, as one of nostalgic leaders put it, the biggest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. But nor was it, as some analysts and diplomats dreamt, the end of history. Ten years later, in this very city, another major event took place, this time a real catastrophe. It reminded us, in the most horrific way, that history was not over and that it remained tragic. On that terrible day, even those who had failed to pay heed to a decade of green wars in the Balkans and the Caucasus, in Africa and in Afghanistan, had to abandon their illusions that a new world order free of conflicts had emerged for good. The attacks on New York and Washington were not aimed at a single country, but instead targeted a set of values and a way of life, freedom and democracy. September 11 reminded us that the world remains a true battlefield. A battlefield not among religions, as many people claim, or nations, but a battlefield within every religion, every nation and every culture. A battlefield between those who try to build and those who seek to destroy, between those who, who choose freedom and those who pledge to eradicate it. A battlefield between the nihilism and the very idea of civilization. And 10 years later, the remarkable upheavals in the Arab world have offered us yet more, more proof that there is no end to history and there is, is there a clash and nor there is a clash of civilization. Instead, a universal call to freedom is rising even in places where some doubted it could ever raise. It is being met by a monstrous effort to quell it. As we speak, the highest heaven and the deepest abyss are once again in conflict. And it is our duty as leaders to wait in and speak out to decide and to act. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates, the first anniversary I evoked earlier, the fall of Soviet tyranny, continues to reverberate today in important ways. When that moment came 20 years ago, for us, the former subjects of Soviet bureaucracy, students, artists, dissidents, workers, men and women, old and young, it was hardly the end of history, but on the contrary, it was a new beginning of history. Communism had frozen our will in a cold and closed museum. When it collapsed, the doors of history swung open again. We found ourselves confronted at once by both the best and the worst. The best transpired for those nations, quickly integrated into the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The others, like the people of my country, Georgia, were left to the mercy of failed states, failed states, civil unrest, wars, 
ethnic cleansing and foreign occupation. Two years ago, from this very podium, I suggested that there were two ways to leave communists behind and to re-enter history. There are the ways of Václav Havel and the way of Slobodan Milosevic. The way of liberal democracy and tolerance on one side and the way of authoritarians and ethnic nationalists on the other. There are, in other words, men who embrace freedom and men who erect mental and physical walls. To the latter, who still see the extension of the European Union NATO as a threat, I would like to say that the Cold War ended in December 91, that they should not be afraid of having democratic neighbors wishing to join wider democratic clubs. There is no hidden agenda of a secret poll in, in, or plot in any of those capitals to undermine the sovereignty of bigger nations. The Cold War ended 20 years ago, and slowly, but too slowly, new rules are emerging. And even those rules are still too rarely applied. Step by step, though, tyrants start to fear that they could one day be held accountable for their crimes. There will be, I am convinced, less and less tolerance for the ethnic cleansing and other war crimes that have stained my country and so many others. This is the very reason of our existence as the United Nations, is it not? To make the world a little better, to finally enforce the rules, charters, laws and principles upon which we all have agreed. It is time to understand that the world has changed, that an army, as powerful as it might seem, cannot ultimately ultimately deny the will of the people that a government as strong as it might look cannot unilaterally and freely dismember sovereign nations, that we are not in 1938 or in 1968, but in 2011. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, as I speak, uh, the Russian Federation militarily occupies 20 percent of sovereign Georgian territory in violation of international law and August 12, 2008 ceasefire agreement. As I speak, almost 500,000 internally displaced persons and refugees in a country of less than 5 million people continue to suffer because they are denied their right, a right reaffirmed over a dozen times by this very house to return to their homes and villages. They cannot go back because in Moscow, a foreign leader has decided that their home is no longer their home. To such cynicism and brutality, we respond with calls for justice and commitments to peace. Last year, on November 23rd, I addressed the European Parliament and solemnly pledged that Georgia would never use force to liberate those of its regions currently occupied by the Russian Federation, even though the UN Charter, as we well know, gives us the authority to do so. We definitely renounce military means to restore our territorial integrity. The commitment I made before the European Parliament is legally binding. I have sent relevant letters to the Secretary General of the UN and other international organizations. It will soon be one year since Georgia renounced the use of force, ladies and gentlemen. One year and we are still waiting for Russia's <coughs> leadership to reciprocate the gesture of peace. Unfortunately, instead of dialogue, the response we have received has come in the form of a dozen terrorist acts targeting Georgia, attacks directly organized and supervised, as is well confirmed by different international actors by <coughs> confirmed officers of the Russian Secret Services. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cold War is over, but some leaders have still to realize it and stop reasoning in terms of spheres of influence, near abroad, domination and zero-sum games. The Cold War is over, but embargoes, blackmails and brutal diktats are still used against Ukraine, Moldova or Belarus. The Cold War is over, but even the Baltic states have to face manipulations of their democratic political landscape and neocolonial games with their minorities. The Cold War is over, but the old Soviet habit to play an ethnic and religious hatred is still alive. It is especially true in the black hole that North Caucasus has become, with brutal violence, with displacement and killing of tens and hundreds of thousands of its inhabitants. Georgia responding to this brutal danger of politics by opening its borders, inviting people to come and exchange debate and dialogue by trying to overcome the informal blockades and by trying to rebuild the bridges among nations. These essential bridges that others are systematically destroyed. Georgia is responding to military build-ups with programs to its children or, uh, to lift children out of poverty through access to modern technologies. 
computer, computers, internets, with turbo military buildup and new bases, with new hotels, new bicycle roads, new boulevards. Georgia is responding to methods of the past by embracing the promises of the future, new health care system, hundreds of new hospitals. Our programs on advanced programs on non-communicable diseases and insurance for everybody in the country and many, many others. Mr. President, the end of the Cold War launch, launched an era of opportunity and turbulence, liberating local dynamics in ways both tragic and exultant, and leading to a constant lux, flux in world order. It has unleashed hatred, ethnic conflict, mass terror, genocide, many other human calamities. But it is also has generated fantastic emancipations. Think of the colored revolutions of Eastern Europe, the dazzling development of Asia, the progress of democracy in Africa, or more recently the Arab Spring. None would have been possible if the Soviet Union still existed as a global player and a global threat to all the continents, Africa, Asia, Europe alike, and the others. Since 1991, history has become more and more unpredictable swinging violently between the highest heaven and the deepest abyss, Schelling was referring to. Indeed, who could have anticipated the global consequences of the desperate act by a 26-year-old Tunisian, Mohamed Bouazizi, in the remote town of Sidi Bouzid? One poor man, in an unknown place, was denied his right by imperious police, and like a distant echo of Czech, Jan Palak, in front of the Russian tanks in 1968, he immolated himself. This breathtaking act of despair, ladies and gentlemen, has literally turned the world upside down. Some dictators are jailed or on the run. Regimes which considered untouchable have collapsed. New constitutions and orders are being born. An entire region and culture derogatorily labeled as unfit for democracy by some people in more developed countries has, the, has given the very world, and the, including the developed world, the, a lesson in freedom. Such historical eruptions always come as a surprise. They require from us all this radical astonishment that Aristotle considered as the very beginning of philosophy, the first step towards true wisdom, a radical emancipation from our prejudices and dogmas. Very few predicted the revolutions that swept across Eastern and Central Europe in 1989, of the current revolutions that followed 15 years later. And even fewer predicted Tunis, Cairo, Benghazi, and Tripoli. The popular call for freedom that has shaken the world in 2011 is the best, most definitive answer to the hatred that motivated the attacks against this very city. Ten years ago, when aspiring populations are free, to live their lives, practice their trade, raise their children, voice their ideas, and press their grievances, the space for terrorists to recruit or demagogues to sow ethnic hatred starts to evaporate. International police, military and international co inter intelligence cooperation in the war against Al-Qaeda has been or are still essential protecting our freedoms over the past decade. I am proud that Georgia has become more than has borne more than its share in the international effort in Afghanistan. I am proud of our soldiers, more than thousands of them, who risk everything in order to defeat the international movement of hatred, and I want to pay tribute to those who have died in the battlefield. I am proud of our police who are engaged in the struggle against nuclear trafficking. I am proud that Georgia has become a provider, not just a consumer of international security. I am proud of all of this, but I am also very aware that extremists will not be defeated Terrors will not be eradicated by military and police means alone. Terrors and extremists can be defeated only if freedom, democracy, and prosperity extend their reach in the world. This is why we welcome so genuinely the efforts of President Obama and President Rousseff in launching an open government initiative. The, the world has to respond to the universal call for freedom and justice, and only in a coordinated response to this call can guarantee our common long-term security. Georgia is really, once again, to take more, willing to take more than its share in the international effort, our experience of radical post-revolutionary transition over the post eight years could well be useful for the newly liberated lands. In 2003, we were a totally failed state, a dying economy, a country destroyed by corruption and authoritarian structures. 
In 2003, a peaceful popular revolution brought to power a young team of reformists. From one day to the next, we were in charge of a fragile country in a totally hostile geopolitical environment. We discovered quickly that the slogans, roses, flags, and other tools we used as opposition and civil society leaders would no longer suffice. We discovered in the fact that revolutions are not only and not even mainly about the crowds gathering in the streets, that they consist essentially in the long and difficult process that of reform that follows, the uprising. This is the main challenge that Tunisia, Egypt, or Libya now face. The uplifting images of people celebrating liberation in Tahrir Square or Libyan citizens dancing in Muammar Gaddafi's palaces are already in the past. The successes of those revolutions will depend on what happens after the legions of reporters from CNN, BBC, and Al Jazeera have left. This is precisely the moment when our Georgian experience, successes, and shortcomings would prove useful. Of course, we hardly succeeded in anything, and we made our mistakes. But we also had had astonishing results. In the aftermath of Rose Revolutions, we fired our entire police force, the 100% of policemen. Georgia lived for three months without a single policeman. Amazingly, during this very period, the crime rates went down dramatically. Why? Not only because the police was responsible in large part of our crime rate, but also that there was a shared feeling that our citizens finally had a stake and they were living actors in a very specific moment of our nation's history. A moment when everything seems possible, when values become the basis of politics, when you have the feeling of inventing your own future. This feeling is the true engine of history and our best ally against extremists. But it is a fragile feeling, and it has to be nurtured and sustained. In Georgia, we managed to keep this feeling alive until now by permanent process of reform with clear benchmarks. Thanks to radical changes in our police force, customs, tax service, bureaucratic structures, and thanks to the widespread feeling among people that they own this transformation, we have made greatest progress on Transparency International Corruption Index since 2003 than any other state in the world. We are second or third least corrupt state in Europe, according to EBRD survey. We have built a highly favorable investment climate based on efficiency, transparency, and the rule of law. As a result, we are now ranked as one of the easiest places to, in the world to do business. World Bank ranked Georgia based on five years' record as world's number one economic reformer. No other country has progressed in that five years period as we did. And we are number one place in Eastern and Central Europe in terms of doing business. As I said, one of the easiest places in the world. The 2011 EBRD survey on countries in transition singles out Georgia as the most successful country in our region in terms of institution building uh, on par with developed European countries. There is still a lot to be done, obviously, and we are more committed than ever to pursuing our path of reforms to continue to build our democracy, even as the barrels of hostile tanks point at us just 40 kilometers away from our capital. Of course, the path of efficient democratic government is difficult, but it is the only path. Of course, people will be impatient and disappointed, but there is no alternative to the success of this call for freedom. This is why it's so important to support this call and to deter those who want to suppress it. This is why we supported the NATO-led intervention in Libya and the initiative of UK, France, and the US. This very fact that the NTC is now sitting here in this room, and Gaddafi no longer can speak from this podium, can give the hope to the future to all of us. The very fact that this effort was approved by the UN Security Council has shown that this institution can actually be the essential framework of the defense of human rights. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, the double anniversaries we are marking, the anniversary of the fall of the Soviet Empire and the anniversary of 9-11, continue to confront us with the central question. How can we ensure that the new spaces that have opened in our world in the past 20 years, thanks to the fall of dictators, thanks to the spread of new technologies, are filled by peace rather than violence, by tolerance rather than extremism, and by freedom rather than new forms of enslavement? History will judge our generation by how actively we help to answer this question, particularly in a series of pivotal arenas, in what people can abuse the frozen to conflicts, in and near my region, in the many countries, our international community that remain under tyranny's yoke, and in the places like those Arab states that have achieved a new spring of freedom, 
and are starting to difficult work of reforms. While Gonim, the young Egyptian Google executive who helped connect and mobilize so many of his country's people to stand up for freedom, recently said that the new revolutions like the one his country experienced are a little like Wikipedia. They are grand, open projects in which everyone can contribute. The need for participation applies to us as well. As nation leaders, as key decision makers, we can contribute and we must contribute. Let us rise to that historical imperative. Let us all make our contributions so that together we may avoid the deepest abyss and strive instead for the highest heaven. Thank you. Au nom de la...